Good morning, friends. So we are going to continue the work that you started last week with Pastor Horner. Uh, last week, you uh, started by looking at the cross as ransom or substitution. And uh, I'm, I heard that Pastor Horner introduced you to the idea of atonement and atonement theology or theories of atonement. Uh, and so this week, we're going to shift gears a, a little bit, um, and we're going to look at example, how the cross and Jesus call us to live as he did. Um, but before we dig into our scripture for today, um, I thought it would be important for us to uh, talk about how Jesus is our example um, for life. Because we have those four books of the Bible, the Gospels, that give us a rather detailed and diverse picture of uh, Jesus' life, his teachings, um, and all of that. And Jesus did a lot of teaching, teaching his disciples how to live their lives. And in turn, Jesus does a lot of teaching for us as well. So these are not in your outline, um, but I thought important things for us to touch on um, this morning. So first and foremost, Jesus teaches us how to pray. He gives us the example of what prayer looks like. Most famously, he gives us the Lord's Prayer, um, and that we see uh, in, in, Matthew, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, he gives us that reading that we hear on Ash Wednesday that sets us up for Lent, what our prayer lives are to look like as we journey toward the cross during Lent. Um, second, Jesus teaches us love, right? That's probably um, an obvious one. He teaches us love of God. He teaches us that great commandment, the greatest commandment. Uh, most nobly, that comes um, in Matthew 22. Um, he teaches us love of neighbor, right? And also in Matthew 22, with the, that commandment, the greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus teaches us the golden rule. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. That's kind of the more modern way of, of a talking about that. And we find that in both Matthew and Luke. Thirdly, uh, Jesus teaches us faith in God, what a faithful life looks like. Um, in Luke chapter 12 and in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, Do not worry. God will provide. This is my own uh, synopsis of what Jesus says. He says, look at the birds of the air. Look at the flowers. God provides for them. Why wouldn't God provide for you? You, you child of God. Um, what else? Um, or think about uh, Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. That's a pretty faithful way of living. Jesus prays to God to, to trust in, in where God is leading Jesus um, in that moment. A fourth, Jesus teaches us about service, what a life of service is to look like. Uh, we're going to be really digging deep into one of the examples, and that is Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. Um, Jesus talks about what uh, leadership looks like in terms of service. Um, he teaches his disciples that their leadership should look different from other forms of leadership um, in, in their time. Not self-seeking, not self-serving, not domineering, but rather a life that is led as a servant, a servant of all. Jesus said, whoever would be first among you must be servant of all. And that comes both out of Mark and Matthew. Um, also, in terms of service, think of the story of the Good Samaritan from Luke. That's a beautiful story of service, what it looks like to care for those who are in need. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> number five, friends. Um, Jesus teaches us what a life of forgiveness looks like. Um, that famous inter exchange between Peter and Jesus. Jesus, how many times am I supposed to forgive? Seven times, 77 times, Jesus tells Peter. 
Or think of Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Um, and then finally, um, another, another story, the prodigal son. That is a beautiful story of what God's grace looks like um, and what forgiveness uh, looks like in our lives. Uh, number six, Jesus' healings. Jesus' healings show us what a life of compassion and kindness and care uh, for those on um, the margins of society, what, what they look like. So just some things to highlight, you know, Jesus is healing of anyone with leprosy. Those are the people that were on the margins of Jesus' society, and Jesus went to them and healed them. Um, or think about the story of the hemorrhaging woman in Mark, um, or even the man with the demon in Gerasene. Uh, living in the graveyards. And then finally, feeding those in need. That's another example Jesus provides for us, and most famously, we think of the feeding of the 5,000 um, there. So that's just a little bit of a brief introduction of example that I wanted to lift up for all of you. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about a Atonement theology. I'm going to get a little heady with you, um, much like Pastor Horner did. Uh, so, so what about the cross? How's the cross an example for us? So Pastor Horner talked a little bit about um, atonement theology. I'm going to focus my discussion here with you around moral influence theory. Moral influence theory, if you want to write that down. Um, which we see most often um, in the work of St. Augustine, who uh, combined this type of theory with the ransom theory that Pastor Horner talked about um, last week, um, but was really like fleshed out and, um, by Peter Abelard in the 12th century. So what is moral influence theory? Succinctly, it is more than just about Jesus' death, but it's also about his life, as I was just talking about. Yes, Jesus saved us through his death, but he also saved us in his life, through what he taught us in his life. Uh, this posits that Jesus was killed because of his moral character, his radical call to change society as it was during his time. Uh, this theory focuses on Jesus as not just example, but also as teacher and as martyr. Um, and so this theory would say that, like I said, Jesus' life and his death are the catalyst for change in society, but also the change in our hearts. Uh, Jesus' life and death inspire us to follow his example. All right. So, how's that sound? That's some thick stuff. I recognize that. Well, I'm going to perhaps complicate this just a little bit more. Um, because as I was thinking about this week, this, this week, friends, um, I thought about um, my own position in life, my own life experience um, as a woman. And I began to think about some things that I read about atonement uh, theology and theory in seminary. And so how I'm going to set this up is I want you to think about the fact that context matters. We all read the Bible. We all read theology and how we think about God differently based on our life experience, who we are, what we look like. And so I would say for the last, oh, 50 years or so, um, but probably even longer than that, feminist theologians have had a lot to say about atonement theology. And that's coming from their place as women, living life as women in this world, which I think we can all agree men and women have different life experiences, right? 
And so recognizing that most of these theories were written by men. And so a female lens was read over what these men had to say about Jesus and the cross. And what came out of a lot of these conversations, these theological conversations, was some problems with atonement theology. And a lot of those issues revolve around the glorification of suffering. That these theories say it is good to suffer. And these female theologians were like, whoa, wait a minute. That doesn't make sense to us. Because in glorifying suffering, these theologies had the potential to encourage violence against women. So I'm just going to give you a little bit about what feminist theologians have to say about substitutionary um, atonement, which Pastor Horner talked about uh, last week. So because it claims that suffering and obedience are acts of salvation, this can be seen as dangerous for women or any marginalized individual um, because it fails to recognize that there is structural evil in our world. Uh, Second, moral influence theory, as I just mentioned, um, has a positive light on it according to feminist theologians, uh, because it does talk about a way of life and this following the example of Jesus. However, it can also be problematic um, because it can encourage women or any oppressed person to love and suffer even to the point of death. And so that can be problematic. And again, doesn't take into consideration the structural evil um, that plays in the lives of a lot of people. So, friends, all of this is to say, um, and this is a little bit of my own theology here, God does not require our suffering. Suffering is not an act of salvation in our lives. Because I believe that God does not want us to suffer. Rather, God promises to be with us in our suffering. And to me, that's the overwhelming promise of the cross. So that's, that's my, my takeaway from all of what I just said. All that heady stuff, um, I see promise um, in all of it. That's the promise that I see in all of it, that God is with us in our suffering. So that was my lengthy introduction um, for all of you today. Um, So let's start to look at um, what's outlined uh, before you here, um, beginning with John 13, verses 1 to 20. I don't know if some of you might already have those opened up there. Um, I want to say, first and foremost, that um, this is probably my favorite story from John, but it is also my favorite story from the Bible. (laughs) So, you know, for what that's worth. I just love the symbolism. I love the meaning of Jesus washing um, the feet. Um, I love what it means for us as followers of Jesus. You know, if you care, this is Pastor Liz's favorite Bible story. (laughs) So let's read that. I'm going to, I'll read that for you. Now, before the festival of the Passover... Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him 
He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Simon answered, or Jesus answered, you, you do not know now what, I'm, what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you, to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but it is to fulfill the scripture. The one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he Very truly, I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. It's good, right? This is such a good story. You don't have to agree with me. That's okay. So, most notably, verse 15 is where example is being used here. So what is Jesus trying to exemplify for us? Well, the short answer for you is service and love. Those two things that I mentioned um, in my introduction, excuse me. So what Jesus has just done, wash the disciples' feet. Verses 15 through 20 are kind of what Jesus is, is kind of where Jesus is sharing the explanation of what he, what he just did. Because what he wants the disciples to understand is that he, as their teacher, their leader, is washing their feet. And this is the paradox of this story. Someone who is in power, in leadership, taking the role of a servant. Someone who should be expecting service is flipping things upside down. And he is doing the the service as opposed to those who are following him. Uh, Something else to note, when Jesus talks about this example, um, he also is looking ahead to what he's about to say later on in chapter 13. Uh, Famously, what we read on, also read as a part of our Monday Thursday reading, where Jesus talks about the love commandment. They will know that you are my followers because you show love. And that following Jesus is about a life of service and a life of love. And we're called to embody that love and service uh, for one another. And this is the big way that we reveal who Jesus is to the world. And I love this. Um, Gail O'Day, who is an, an excellent, excellent scholar of uh, the Gospel of John, um, she talks about how in loving and serving as Jesus does, we put on this new identity for ourselves and that we are shaped by who Jesus is. And I just love this idea of our identity being shaped by Jesus and our identity shaped as Jesus um, and that our lives of service are are evidence of of that identity. I think that's some of what I was trying to talk about a couple weeks ago when I was talking about our lives as children of God in a sermon. 
Uh, what else do I want to tell you? Um, this explanation and act of love is also important uh, because Jesus is presenting a choice to the disciples here. And in turn, he's kind of presenting a choice for us. Embrace this gift of love, Jesus says. Embody this love in our lives or reject Jesus' love and not use it to you know, make a mark on this world, so to speak. Um, a lot of times in John, Jesus is talking about what community looks like, a community and um, the presence of Jesus in our lives. And Jesus here is saying, this community, this group of disciples, that's your choice. You know, do, do you want to be called to, to love and service or, or not? Um, it's also worth noting here, friends, um, and, and the reason I want to, to notice this um, is because this is about example, understanding what Jesus is calling us to. And before this story, actually in chapter 12, Mary anoints the feet of Jesus. You know what story I'm talking about? I hope so. This, that story foreshadows the one that we are talking about right now because it tells us that Mary gets it. Mary gets that the life that we are called to as followers of Jesus is a life of service. And she shows that service to Jesus. And it's a big reason why, Ma why Mary is praised by Jesus because, because she gets it. Um, finally... I want to touch on example and um, what that word um, could potentially uh, be translated in Greek. Our Bibles translate it as, well, the NRSV, I should say. Some of you might not have NRSV in front of you. But NRSV translates that as example. But it could also be translated as model, which kind of, you know, makes sense. It's a, a similar word there. But also it could be pattern. And I really like this. This kind of did a, an interesting shift in, in my brain. As Jesus is our example, our model, he's also showing us a pattern, a way of life. Um, and I like that idea that Jesus is showing us a pattern to mimic, uh, so to speak. And then, actually, I lied. I have one more thing I want to tell you about this story. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> I also want to draw your attention to um, one final thing, and that is Jesus washes everybody's feet in that room. Everyone's feet is washed. That includes Judas. Judas's feet are washed as well. And I don't know about, about you, but that's an example for us as well. And the example that even the people in our lives that hurt us are often the people that we are still called to serve, the people that we are called to forgive, the people that disappoint us, the people that betray us. And so I just wanted to lift that up as well. I feel like that was something that I said last year on Monday Thursday, a similar uh, thing that I talked about in my Monday Thursday sermon, if I remember correctly. So... That is John 13, the best story in the Bible, in my personal opinion. <laughs> All right, are you ready for John 21? I hope so. All right, so this story is a post-resurrection appearance, um, and I'll read it for you right now. So this is John 21, starting at verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend 
my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. So as I said, this is one of Jesus's resurrection appearances um, coming after his appearance to Thomas and the disciples. Um, This story comes after what I like to call Jesus's beach barbecue in which Peter has decided Jesus is not with us anymore. So I'm going to go fishing. And the disciples say, Peter, that's a great idea. We'll go fishing with you. Um, And they go fishing, and Jesus appears on the beach, tells them where to throw their nets. They catch an abundance of fish. And then Jesus calls them back to the shore, and they eat breakfast together. And it's just a good little story about uh, eating breakfast on the beach. And that's why I call it Jesus' Beach Barbecue. But anyway, um, that's what comes before this. And that's what these two stories are often, well, they are tied together because they're happening at the same place. Um, This is probably no surprise to you. Uh, You probably have heard this before, but this back and forth is an echo of of Peter's three denials of Jesus. So those three three times that he denies Jesus are, um, this is his opportunity to say, no, for real, Jesus, I do do love you. And so they echo um, one another. Um, And so obviously... Jesus is questioning Peter's love for him here. And every time he tells him, I want you to feed and care for my sheep. So what Jesus is teaching Peter here is your love of me is connected to the care and love for others. So these two things are tied together. I don't think that's going to come as a surprise um, to any of you. Um, and also, Jesus is recalling what we just read, what we just read from John 13. He's reminding Peter of what he did. He washed his feet as a servant would wash his feet. And also reminding Peter of what he said. We, though we didn't hear it, I referenced it. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. And that Peter's love for Jesus should be put into practice by the feeding, caring for, and loving the sheep, the other people of this world. And that this is what it means to love Jesus. That our love for Jesus is embodied in how we care for and love others. I don't think that's a surprising thing for me to say. Uh, I also want to tell you that this message here... Um, also echoes something that Jesus said in chapter 14 of John, verse 21. He said, They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal them to myself. And that as we see Peter in this story Yes, Jesus is our example, but also Peter acts as an example for us as well. What the life of loving Jesus looks like. Peter exemplifies that in how he goes about what we will eventually hear in the book of Acts. So that's John 21. Are we ready for Ephesians? Okay. Like I said, I'm going to read that for you friends, so that my friends 
online can also hear it. So then, putting away falsehood, let us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So before we talk about this specifically, I kind of want to give you a picture of the overall message and purpose of the letter to um, the Ephesians first. First and foremost, I hate to say this, um, but most scholars believe that this was not written by Paul, but instead somebody who was influenced by the writing of Paul. And why scholars believe that is because, this feels really silly to say, but this type of being influenced by the writing of somebody was very, and then writing something that sounded very similar was very popular during this time. This wasn't just happening in the religious section of life. It was happening in the secular part of the world um, as well. And so that is to say, plagiarism was pretty normal during that time. <laughs> um, so why do scholars believe this? Uh, first and foremost, um, there is a shift from Paul's writings where there's this idea that at, Jesus is coming soon, like immediately Jesus is coming back. Whereas in books like Ephesians and Colossians, there doesn't seem to be such a urgency behind the, the return of Jesus. So the books of Ephesians and Colossians focus more on, we're waiting for Jesus, now what? How are we to live our lives as we are waiting for the return of Jesus? Um, so... What we're going to read um, here from, well, what we did read from, um, from Ephesians, and later when we um, look at First Peter, um, those are what scholars call household codes. Um, and so there's this shift from, you know, this immediate to how are we going to live our lives. And so how do our uh, lives, uh, what do our lives look like um, now that we're waiting for Jesus. I apologize. I'm very distracted by the preschoolers back there. They look like they're going on some like scavenger hunt. So <laughs> they look cute. They look very, very cute. Um, the second thing is um, how the author of Ephesians and Colossians talks about what the church is, the understanding of what the church is shifts from what Paul has written in what they call the undisputed letters to, to these. And what I mean by that is um, how the author talks about the role of the work of the church in the world. Um, Paul um, is writing to very specific churches, congregations, um, in fact. And so they are congregations with like very specific problems Whereas these are written to um, more a, a, a larger crowd of folks, groups of churches even. And he talks about not the local congregation, as Paul does, but talks about the church more broadly. I think of it as how we talk about 
the body of Christ. So Colossians and Ephesians likes to talk about the church as the body of of Christ. Not necessarily a, a physical location, but more of a philosophical idea, so to speak. And then um, the third thing, and this really isn't, um, these, those two really aren't related, but I just wanted to tell you, um, is how Paul talks about himself. In the other letters, Paul is often defending himself and defending his role as an apostle. Whereas in these books, Paul is talking a lot about, Paul is talking a lot about his suffering and why he is suffering. He's suffering on behalf of the, those who he is writing to, as opposed to um, Paul, real Paul, undisputed Paul, talks about um, his suffering on behalf of the gospel, on behalf of Christ. So... All of that is to say, I hope that was helpful, um, a little off, off the beaten path there, but I just wanted to bring that information um, to your attention. So what he, here is the, 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 the thing that we should, should be focusing on here? Because verse 1 of chapter 5 tells us that we are to be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Well, all of the things that come before are what the author would say we are to imitate. So we are to live our lives truthfully. We aren't to lie. Uh, We aren't to let our anger rule our lives. We aren't to steal. We are to work to provide for ourselves. Um, We are to think about what we say and the impact of what we say. Succinctly, we're to forgive. It's about forgiveness. Um, There's also those lists of vices to avoid, bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, slander, and malice. Um, And all of this is... Remember how to live as a community with one another. We, as a, I mean, I think about it as we live as a church, a local church. I recognize that I'm bringing it down to um, a, a different level than what, what, they're, what the author intended, but we live in community. How are we to live in community um, with one another? And uh, the final thing that I want to uh, bring to your attention here is that imitate piece. We are to imitate Jesus. We are to be like Jesus. Um, As people who are called children of God, we are to imitate that that parent, big P parent, God. Um, and this is a quote that I, I took from one of the scholars I read, and I cannot remember who, who, who said it, so I apologize for that. Um, drawing a comparison between how we learn by imitating our parents um, and other important adults in our lives. And so I liked how that was framed for us. I think that's kind of what Pastor Horner was saying recently in a sermon as well, that we are to imitate God like we as children imitated our parents. So that is Ephesians for you. We're going to dive into 1 Peter next. And this is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. And this is fun. This is where it gets kind of sticky and difficult to, um, to explain to be honest with you, and to talk about. So, 1 Peter 2, picking up with verse 18. Slaves, accept the authority of your masters with all deference, not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. For it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, 
leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was, in his, was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. So as I mentioned when I was talking about Ephesians, um, this is an example from 1 Peter, one of those household codes. Um, Again, asking that question, how do we live our lives while we're waiting for the return of Jesus? And like much of um, the writings um, in our New Testament, um, and I mentioned this prior um, when I was talking about plagiarism being common um, in the secular world, um, these types of household codes were also um, being written by secular, if you will, um, thinkers. So like Plato and Aristotle wrote about household household codes. For whatever reason, that's a hard phrase to say this morning. Um, And the reason they were writing about it and the reason that scholars believe Um, folks were writing about it um, in the church um, was with the intention of saying that the security and unity of the state depended on the security and unity of the family. That the larger government powers of the world uh, depended upon the the work of the, the folks down here, of families of individual family units. Um, And you might ask the question, why were they concerned with this? Well, that's because people outside of the church were basically saying, and why, why folks were suffering was because they were saying, you know, you, your religion, your faith is harming that, the powers that be. And in trying to protect themselves and um, protect their community of families, the leaders of that time were were telling these individual Christian families, um, point to the fact that you are living in a right, uh, secure way, that you aren't seeking to harm the powers um, that be, to try to not draw attention um, to yourselves. And it was just kind of a a, a protection mechanism, um, if you will. Um, I also want to touch on uh, the fact that, and the reason why this is kind of hard for us as North American Christians to hear is because... um, Well, because of our history. We as North American Christians have a different worldview, or we should have a different worldview than those who are writing in this time. Because we now believe that slavery is inhumane, right? Slavery is wrong. And so it's hard for us to to read and 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 make some meaning out of this when we don't have that same touch point um, to the context, um, that context at hand. But I want to lift up that I see a little tidbit for us. And I'm going to quote um, a scholar that I read this week. And this is David Bartlett, who was a professor at Yale Divinity School. And he, has to, and he had to say this in, in talking about first, this section of 1 Peter. He writes, Christian freedom lives out of Christ's freedom. And Christ's freedom did not include the freedom to repay evil for evil, but freedom to repay good for evil. We are not to use violence to resist violence, not fight fire with fire. And I found that helpful 
in my own reading of this. Um, in something that was difficult for me to read as a North American Christian who doesn't necessarily understand the context to which um, these authors were writing. And that Christ's example shows us that. That we aren't to repay evil for evil. We're to repay it with good. So, that is First Peter. Are we ready to round things out with Hebrews? Which is funny that <laughs> Hebrews comes before First Peter, but for whatever reason, we are going to talk about Hebrews last. I just noticed that, um, which is funny. So you're going to need to flip forward in your Bibles here as we look at Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 13. All right. The author writes, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross disregarding its shame and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you might not grow weary or lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as children. Excuse me. My child, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord or lose heart when you are punished by him. For the Lord disciplines those whom he loves and chastises every child whom he accepts. Endure trials for the sake of discipline. God is treating you as children. For what child is there whom a parent does not discipline? If you do not have that discipline in which all children share, then you are illegitimate and not his children. Moreover, we had human parents to discipline us, and we respected them. Should we, not even, should we not be even more willing to be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share his holiness. Now, discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant at the time, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. So obviously here, verse 2 Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, is kind of that example verse um, for us. And so first and foremost, what the author of Hebrews is trying to share is that looking to Jesus, not just as example, but the one we look to in everything, um, what this author is using is a lot of athletic metaphors, so that running that race, um, and the, the readers are to see this not as, um, a, as a preparation for a race, a race that not, has not yet been finished. And the th overwhelming theme here is endurance. Endurance is the faith for the, the readers of, of Hebrews. Uh, plainly speaking, Jesus is the model for how to endure in suffering. Um, and something to note here is um, this isn't about martyrdom per se. It's not a call to death. It's a call to faith and endurance. And that the cross is something that Jesus endured. Uh, what else do I want to tell you. There was something that was really, really good that I read this morning. There it is. So the author of Hebrews, like I said, uses this imagery of preparing for a race, a race that's not yet over. And the race that is to be run is a race that looks at Jesus. 
And I loved this phrase that was used here. This is forward looking faith. I love that phrase, forward looking faith. The readers of Hebrews are to look away from the bad stuff that is happening, instead look to Jesus. And that is who is to be their atten- the focus of their attention, but the one who they also look to for guidance and for help in these times of suffering. And that this forward-looking faith is the goal. And the goal is the presence of God, and that Jesus makes it possible for us to be in the presence of God. Of God, and that our forward looking faith gives us that gift. And I love that, I just love that phrase forward looking faith. All right, so as I said, it's also about endurance, endurance in suffering, and Jesus as the example of what endurance looks like in suffering. Because very clearly, there was some suffering happening in this community, and they needed encouragement to to get through it. And so something else to note here is the the fact that Jesus identified with, with this community that was suffering. In fact, Jesus identifies with all of us in our suffering. And in my mind... Um, That is the most important thing um, for us to get out of this passage. Um, That, yes, we as North American Christians have not, nor will we probably ever, suffer in the way that these folks that this letter was originally written to suffered. That, yes, our suffering might look different, But pain is something that we inherently, as humans, will experience. And that God is with us in that pain. So that could be pain of losing a loved one, of having a difficult diagnosis, or any type of physical pain. And the promise here is that Jesus knows that pain. Because Jesus suffered pain as God and human Um, on the cross, and that the promise is God will show up in our lives um, in that pain, and that he he shows up in in amazing ways and in amazing people, in in caregivers and doctors and nurses, in in church members who, who visit us and send us cards and in prayers and support. And that, and, and to me, that's the overwhelming message here, that Jesus identifies with us in our pain and our suffering. Um, so... And, it, and that kind of draws me back to, that, to one of that first point that I made, that God does not wish for us to suffer, friends. That is not, that our suffering is not a requirement for God. That instead, the cross is where God has shown us that God shows up when there's pain and suffering in the world. So that's what I have for you for today. Um, next week, you will be meeting with Pastor Horner again, and he will be, as your outlines say, uh, focusing on sacrifice. And the way the cross shows us that it is a sacrifice for our sins. And so that should be another good conversation for you, and I hope you will join us next week.